To Washington and the push to arm the Libyan rebels, even if it cost us some serious change, potentially tens of millions of dollars. John McCain says, well, worth the price. Republican Congressman Ron Paul says, just more good money after bad. The congressman joins me right now. Congressman, good to have you. You're not a fan Thank of you. just uh, digging in even deeper here, huh? Oh, absolutely not. Where are we going to borrow it from? Well, we'll have to go back with a hat out and ask China for some more money to go and invade another country. It makes no sense whatsoever. And I think the American people are starting to understand that. I, I'm certainly getting a little bit better reception with that message than I did, you know, two or three years ago. But the American people are sick and tired of it. I mean, we're in trouble here and we're spending money uh, overseas. We blow up countries. Then we have to rebuild them at the same time. We can't even rebuild our own infrastructure here. So I, I think that's going to come to an end. I cannot imagine it. Uh, that the American people will continue to put up with this. Congressman, uh, Senator John McCain has been among those echoing um, the need for a sort of a no-fly zone that I guess we would oversee, administer, I guess pay for uh, in, in, in northern Libya particularly. Uh, do we need to do that? Absolutely not. I mean, that's an act of war. What if somebody put a, uh, closed our airspaces down? I mean, the American people would be outraged. We would want to go to war over this. And uh, there's a civil war going on there. You have to pick sides. And uh, even Hillary Clinton says, we don't even know who the good guys are. We'll have to sort it all out. But I'm afraid they will sort it out and pick somebody and then prop them up and, and do what we've been doing there for many, many decades is prop up another dictator along the line. So, uh, no, I, I don't think I think a true revolution uh, is going to work much better if you let the people decide. And I think if, if you're cheering for the revolutionaries, which I am, uh, by us going in, sometimes you can undermine them. So if you have a no fly zone, uh, that's an indication that you're taking sides. So you're shooting at somebody or you're going to not prevent somebody from flying air plane so that's taking size and, and then uh, one thing leads to another one of our planes gets shot down or something and then we'll have to retaliate so I, I, I sort of like the old-fashioned ideas of the founders stay out of entangling an alliance and mind our own business and don't get involved in these internal squabbles and civil wars around the world all right but it always comes back to and, and you're a Texan to oil right and we need this region so we have to be heavily invested in the region is Ron Paul saying the hell with the region that we're not going to put another penny in. Well, I don't use exactly that terminology, <laughs> but I would say <laughs> I would say that we don't need to. Uh, Japan doesn't have any oil wells. <laughs> Why are they over there worried? Where are we going to get the oil? There's an international market. We'll always be there. You can always buy oil. What we need to do is make sure if there were, was a true shortage of oil, that you had a free market answer to these problems. But today, you know, we're not allowed to drill for oil. You can't build a nuclear power plants. So you would put the focus on drilling here rather than trying to pay off friends there. I would at least legalize it and make sure that uh, we'd have, uh, I mean, we can't get in the oil shale and we have, you know, barrels and barrels of that, but, you know, environmentalists keep us from doing that. Right. But we don't know exactly which is the best answer, but the market should decide that. And we, you know, we haven't had a nuclear power plant in uh, three decades, but, you know, maybe electricity is a good option to help our automobiles and if necessary, uh, we could produce a lot of electricity for nuclear power. But I don't think there would be all of a sudden a cutoff of oil if we didn't protect all those countries. You know, if we hadn't been protecting Saudi Arabia and all those others who become dependent on us, I think the oil would still be coming out of there. You well, know, they still I, need I the customer, been... don't they? We're still a big customer. Yeah, they, they sure well, do. Well, let me ask you then about something else that, that sort of unnerved folks, particularly at the Federal Reserve, especially since you've been taken over as their chief uh, antagonist, I guess, with the House change in leadership. Uh, and that prompted a comment from a Federal Reserve <laughs> official calling you a pinhead saying that the guy could be a real pinhead at times, that this is never so evident as in his persistent attack against the Fed. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, it's interesting, but I, I think when people use those terms and go, go after you and call you names, I think they've run out and they've lost the intellectual argument. They've abandoned their intellectual argument. And uh, so I, I don't think it's worth commenting on or challenging on that. Others have already. Uh, Robert Wenzel, a very good free market economist, answered to that attack. And he probably did a much better answer than I ever could. But I, I think that just indicates that he has already lost the intellectual argument. If he thinks I'm going to be defeated because he is so smart and he works for the Fed, and, they, and he calls me a pinhead, that therefore well, everybody well, will well, reject well, everything I said. All right, but Congress, <laughs> I, I want to be clear. You're not saying that anyone, for example, on TV, who might call people, let's say, a pinhead or a patriot, is of 
questionable anything. Well, I think they're not addressing the subject. Uh, you know, I think just calling somebody a name or using right. say, well, this is a pinhead idea doesn't uh, really debate the issue in an intellectual way. Right. And that applies to people at the Fed, certainly not on TV, TV news or certainly Fox News. <laughs> right. Um, could I uh, get a sense from you on this whole government shutdown looming in, a, in less than two weeks if they don't come to some sort of a stopgap spending bill agreement. I don't know what the heck's going on. Um, there are some who welcome it, some who fear it, some who say we're going to really rue the day. We have it. I had the Debt Commission co-chairs on with me yesterday, Congress, and they say, boy, be careful what you wish for because it's going to be a hell of a surprise. What do you say? Well, I don't welcome it. I don't fear it. Uh, I don't think it's likely to come. I think when uh, it gets down to the wire, they'll come up with something. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, bipartisan spirit here. The bipartisanship spent all the money and ran up the debt. They have a bipartisan support for our foreign yeah. policy and the welfare state. So they're going to come up with something. It's just a blame game. Who's going to get blamed the most? And they're going to go down the wire. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, bipartisanship uh, agreement will not involve much in the way of cuts because even the cuts we're talking about are so token that it has so little meaning but uh, I may be wrong and maybe there'll be a shutdown and and uh, maybe uh, we can blame the Fed for all the problems because well, they, it, they, it, would they, be they, those, it would be those pinheads of the Fed if they did it again. oh yeah probably, uh, probably, no I'm <laughs> kidding I'm, I'm kidding, kidding. Uh, Ron Paul always a pleasure sir thank you very very much thank you Neil